Hi, and welcome back to Reflect Forward. I'm your host, Carrie Siggins, and I'm so glad you are here today. Today, my guest is Clément Ducroix. He is the author of The Idea Space, uh, which is a book on the science of mindfulness, not just the science of mindfulness, like the hardcore science of mindfulness. He is awesome. He is so freaking brilliant. We get into discussing all kinds of things, including quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity and a new concept that he is working about how the two meet. He is an engineer by education, works for IBM, doing all kinds of innovation projects and deals. But he left IBM to write this book, to go do something different, to have a side hustle to be able to make money while he's out inventing other things. And so he talks all about this in the podcast, but I just love it. It's so much fun to have a brilliant conversation with a brilliant person. And that's exactly what this podcast is. So hang tight and I will be right back with Come On. All right, everyone, welcome back. I have Clement de Croix with me. Clement, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thanks for having me, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so we are going to talk all kinds of stuff, leadership and leaving the corporate world to start your own business and some of the really cool things that you're doing with Ideaspace. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself to get started. Yeah, I was born in Belgium, then moved to Spain and then moved to the US. I went to a small school with 20 people in my grade. And then in high school, I had 600 people in my grade. And then after that, Penn State, which had 10,000 people in my grade. So this kept going up and up and up. And after college, I wanted to do consulting because it just seemed like a nice, flexible job. And so all the companies I talked to said I needed more financial experience, which I was like, I did mechanical engineering. How was I supposed to get financial experience? So decided to stay next year for kind of a one-year master's program. And then after that, joined IBM and did technical consulting there on the federal practice. So got to work on a lot of cool projects. The first one was an IoT project of flying a drone to check the runway health for kind of like landing planes combined with uh, HVAC, predictive maintenance, and space utility. So making sure spaces and buildings were utilized properly. And then second was doing data analytics for the Department of Defense, which was interesting because they spent $375 billion a year. So it's like, okay, what are you spending that money on? During that time, got involved in doing patents. So submitted 130 patents in one year span, which was really interesting just to see how that process works from start to finish. And then after that, I worked on deals. So leading cloud deals for IBM, specifically with the NSA and trying to get that deal locked down. Then I was burnt out, as many people can be, and decided to go on a two-year hiatus to write a book because I listened to someone named Naval Ravikant, who's the founder of AngelList. And he said, you got to do something that'll make you money while you sleep. And that really resonated with me. So I could code, not the best coder. So I was like, you know what? I read a lot. Might as well try writing a book. So started writing a book, but you can't make money off writing a book. So I decided to make some kind of meditation cards that complement the book uh, and selling those on Amazon. Those are doing really well. Uh, and the book came out on October 10th. So that's been exciting. And yeah, just thriving from there, getting ready to launch a new product in the next couple months here. So yeah, it's a little bit more about myself. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. All right. So did you always think you were going to be an engineer since you went to engineering school? Yeah, I'm a huge nerd. If that didn't come off right off the bat, I always love understanding how the world works on a fundamental level. But it's funny, when I went to college, I started off in the business school. And after a semester, I was like, this sucks. And I went right into engineering, which is kind of the opposite of what everybody else does. But yeah, and then you're an engineer yourself, right? Yeah, but not, I never, I mean, I worked as an engineer for one year out of college. But I'm much more, I like people and I like strategy. And even though I'm really good at math, I doing design was not my jam. So I quickly pivoted it over into operations management, which is you know how I got to where I am today. But I'm really glad for the engineering degree. But that's why I wanted to ask, when you went to engineering school, did you think, oh, yeah, I want to be an engineer and this is the path I'm going down? Yeah, and I'm similar to you. Like, I love the, the science behind the engineering, but I'm more of a people person as well. Um, where a lot of the traditional engineers just like to be in their own little world, which is fine um, if it works for them. But I like working with people, solving problems and uh, doing something cool as a team. So as you were going through your career at IBM, talk a little bit about your leadership journey and what that was like. Did you grow teams, manage teams? Were you an individual contributor? How did you figure out your leadership style? Yeah, great question. So coming off right out of college, you're more of a just trying to learn what's happening and this they used to always say it's like drinking out of a faucet just because especially working in the government they just use acronyms out the wazoo so you're just like i have no idea what you're saying right now (laughs) 
So half of the time we just spend trying to understand their language. But yeah, so I think uh, the first kind of project was just learn the ropes, see what's going on. And I think that's key to leadership is knowing when to follow as well. And then as I spent more time there, started taking more leadership roles for different projects. And I think where I really stepped up on the leadership was twofold. The first was doing the patenting, just being able to work with different people across IBM, which is massive, across the world to do different patents. And then the second was on the deals. For that cloud deal that we worked on, that was a very interesting deal because halfway through, four or five key people on the deal got fired. And so when people get fired, you have to step up. And so at 24, 25 years old, I was driving the orals presentation for a $10 billion cloud deal, which was a lot of pressure. I got to work with the president of IBM at the time. And that was just a very fascinating experience, just being around all that executive leadership and realizing that they're just people too, and that you're supposed to tell them no, so that you're not just a yes person for all of them. And so I think that was really insightful. We ended up losing the deal. And part of the reason we lost the deal is we had to do a benchmark test and we just didn't get it done in time. We were like an hour late to submitting it. And basically you have to run a large process in a cloud server. And when we were running it, we decided to run it in Sydney because we had all the good hardware there, but it was for the NSA, which is obviously a government agency. And so we asked them a little too late, was like, do you want this to be run in the United States? And they were like, yes. So we had to ship everything from Sydney back over to the US and that lost us a lot of time. But I remember during the first day that we got the team together, they were talking about where they want to do it. And I, in my mind, I thought maybe we should do it in the US because it's a federal client, but I didn't say it because I was 24, 25 and these people were seasoned vets. And so I think that was a big learning experience for me of just speaking up, speaking your mind, even if someone else is more senior, just make sure your voice is heard. Oh, what a huge lesson to learn. So what happened? What happened after that? So after that deal, I was just burnt out. That was like a four or five months endeavor. So with deals, we were just like cooking and grinding. And yeah, yeah, so I was just dead after that. And that's when I decided to go on leave for two years and just focus on myself because I thought if I could spend as much time as I did on that deal on something I was passionate about, I wonder what sort of benefits it would get. So kind of wrote the book from there and that leadership style changed a little bit to focusing on myself and then building a team around myself a designer, a website person, and then just working with friends who are part of business partners for the cards, which was, I know you talked to Don on one of your other episodes about working with friends. So I heard that and I was like, yes, I did it. <laughs> that was my goal. So it's been an interesting shift in leadership styles. And now as I'm getting older, just constantly changing that style. Yeah, I understand. All right. So talk to us a little bit about your company, what you started out doing and, and now what the future looks like. Yeah. So the company's Pretty simple. We just sell meditation style cards online. The first product's 100 Mindful Prompts, which includes a day side and a night side. And the day side gives you a quote and a challenge for the day. And then the night side gives you a reflection and a sort of like meditation. The second product is 100 Daily Meditations, which is exactly what it sounds like. 100 Daily Meditations. So one a day, different difficulty ratings and different categories. And the third that's coming out soon is going to be Cards Against Humanities, except more so in the style of it's called Mindful Match. And it's the same thing as Cards Against Humanity, prompt, response, best response wins, but we're adding action cards. So draw five cards, discard five cards, gain a point, just to add a little pizzazz to the game. So that's kind of where the company is now. And the goal of this isn't to like change the world in any revolutionary way, but just to give me that sort of financial stability and freedom so that I can have that base and passive income coming in over time so that the next company that I get involved with or the next company that I start is a little bit more risky, a little bigger, and just taking the lessons I learned from this one and applying them there. Yeah, that's great. So tell me where the idea came from. And before you, you left IBM, were you a meditator and big into mindfulness or was this part of what that to your journey brought for you? Yeah, great question. So I was afraid of the dark when I was younger, like terrified, like I couldn't sleep because the dark was my nemesis. My parents helped me fall asleep, did a lot of body scan meditation. So I was exposed there for the first time. And then when I was just getting older, I was always interested about the mind and consciousness and science and the words idea space just randomly came into my head once. You know how thoughts are. They're just so random. Sometimes it will be like going on a walk like, oh, that's the best thought I've ever had. So those words came to mind. And the big question was like, what if I applied the principles of math to thoughts? Because I did a lot of continuous learning around reading textbooks of math, physics in the morning. But your head is clear. I just continued exploring that route. and. The first draft was 700 pages of, I would say not nonsense, but words on a page. <laughs> 
And so then it's a matter of just editing, editing. And I'm sure you're familiar as well, as well with your new book. Just your first draft isn't the prettiest thing, but then you get it down. And by the end of it, it's something that you're like, okay, I'm proud of this. It makes sense. And it's got a good message behind it. That's great. And so have you always been a writer? Because people ask me that all the time too, right? An engineer, but now you're writing a book. So where did your writing skills and passion come from? Yeah. So never a writer. When I was younger, I actually used to have my mom have to help me write my essays because we moved from Europe. So I spoke French as my main language. So English was a second language. So having to learn English and then write in English was non-trivial for me. And that was, again, more of a math guy. Uh, and I remember even when I was applying for that one-year MBA program, I had to have my brother help me write that essay. So never much of a writer. But the thing about writing is I remember hearing a quote where like, you don't write for anybody except for yourself. And that's like the best way to write. I just started with journaling. I think that's a great way to start writing because you just write for yourself. You don't really care what it says. You got confidence from journaling into writing and you just start writing. And then when the, ed the tr true writing starts in the editing phase, because that's when you want to fine tune everything, make sure you use the right language, the right message and the right flow. Yeah, I agree. When I decided I was going to write a book, I started blogging because I was like, oh, I got to practice and find my voice because I haven't written since I left high school. And so it was kind of the same thing of figuring out what do I want to write about? What does my voice sound like? How do I write, write in a compelling way that makes people care? I completely understand. So what is the most interesting thing that you learned about yourself through this process, leaving the kind of a high tech engineering job and going into this much more soft space of writing and writing about meditation and really helping people in a completely different way. What was it like to go through that transition and what did you learn about yourself? Yeah, learn so much. When you write, you're really able to gather your own thoughts together because you have these ideas and they make sense in your mind. But when you put them onto paper, you, they really, really start making sense. And so I think for me, it was a, a couple of different things. The first was the concept of an idea space as a scientific theory. An idea space is like a mental model for your mind that's congruent with modern physics. Your idea space consists of your thoughts, emotions, sensations, and perceptions. And your idea space has zero measure and it's uncountable, which basically means it looks like nothing to everybody else and it's impermanent. It's always changing. You'll never have the same thought twice, even though uh, it may seem similar. And so I think just coming up with a way to view my own mind in a way that made sense to me, just because I'm a very logical person when it comes to understanding math and physics, but for how good modern physics was, it had yet to come up with a sustainable model for the mind. And I think that was the biggest takeaway for me from this book was coming up with a way to view my mind and my thoughts objectively in the same way that we would view stars or molecules so that I don't continuously attach to my thoughts or emotions and get bogged down by this is mine, like I'm attached to this. And the more I attach to this, the more I'm going to get hurt because it's bound to change. So I think just a lot, developing a model to view my own mind objectively was the biggest takeaway for me. Yeah, that's interesting. I agree with you. Attachment is the root of all suffering. Yes. We do. It causes us suffering. When we do under finally understand that everything is you know, everything is impermanent, then we don't have to get so attached to be things being exactly the way they are now. But that's a really hard concept for people, especially in this materialistic society that we live in where we just have to do more and achieve more and buy more stuff and we measure our success on our titles and what we own. And we just, I think we forget that none of it is ever permanent. And if you're okay with going, okay, this is this part of the journey and what comes next is whatever comes next. It is a more free way to live, but really hard for people to wrap their head around. So I can understand why you want to build a mental model to be able to put that framework in there. So maybe you do have a little bit less. And then suffering. question for you, do you have your own kind of meditation or mindfulness practice? And then what do you do to take that into work and with your employees? Yeah, definitely. I meditate every day and I either do two different types of meditation practices, breath work with mantras or visualization. I'm big on visualizing because we are our thoughts. Our thoughts become us and we become our thoughts. So really trying to not just visualize, but actually feel what I'm trying to visualize, like put my body into the future of whatever I'm trying to visualize happening, which is usually that's something different than <laughs> what I'm doing right now. So those are the two different types of meditation that I do. And what how it really manifests itself in the workplace is that I am much more able to regulate my emotions and not be attached. But I've been working on this for a really long time, right? This whole idea of impermanence and also just being okay with things being the way they are. Not that you don't set goals because I do. I'm very driven, very goal oriented, but also just knowing, okay, well, this is what it is right now. And how do I not get upset by it or annoyed by it or have some sort of emotional reaction? 
how do I just be okay with it and let things unfold with actions and intention and thoughts. And so my meditation practices really helped me be able to bring that sort of mindfulness and acceptance to balance out my drive. So that's how I would Love describe it. it. And then do you feel like your employees, even like the ones that may yeah. not be totally into mindfulness, are able to work with them even through all of this as well? If there's a challenging circumstance, oh, yeah. you're able to share the practice with them? Definitely. Yeah. Take a deep breath. Oftentimes the meeting will start with even just like, you know, a minute, close your eyes, just breathe, or let's everybody just take three collective breaths I love right that. now. And it is amazing how much it settles down. But I also think that the approach of, so I have this the cool, calm, and collected approach. <laughs> That's my mantra. <laughs> Always cool, calm, and collected. Freaking out never makes anything better. And I believe that we feed off of people's energy. And because I can stay calm in a high stakes or a tense situation, I think that also helps other people calm down. If I take a deep breath, for people mirror and I don't even know. And so then they take a deep breath. So I think that subconsciously it's happening in the long too, because I also know when I do get amped up about something, everybody <laughs> else gets it. Really understanding that I need to model the type of behavior that I want to see from my employees. I don't make people do mindfulness practices here. I mean, I always <laughs> encourage it, but not everybody's comfortable with it and thinks it's woo-woo. It's not. Agreed. There's so much science behind it, as you know. How about you? How do you use your mindfulness practice in your day-to-day -day life, especially as you're trying to grow a company and figure out what comes next? Yeah. So for me, I like to start my meetings with just taking three breaths together, 20 seconds. It doesn't have to be a lot, but just being able to stop what was coming in, whatever you were doing before, and then just coming into the present moment and doing that, I think is huge. And then I'm big on the visualization as well of just it may not be perfect, but just having an understanding of where you want to be is huge because a lot of people don't know where they want to be. And then the world is weird and wacky, right? Like as much as you're going towards it, the world is coming towards you in a, in a weird way. So just being able to have that understanding of impermanence and the world is always changing and that you don't control everything inside of it. Um, and this doing your best and Living in the present, I think Joseph Goldstein has a good quote on it where he says, you experience the past as a thought in the present and you experience the future as a thought in the present. So a lot of times we'll worry about the past, things we could do differently or things that we want to do in the future. But if we continuously hone in on that, you, we miss out on the present moment, which it's so cheesy, but it's so true. It's like the only moment we really have. Dwayne The Rock Johnson was on the Joe Rogan Experience today, actually, and they were just talking about enthusiasm and how as cheesy as it sounds, if you bring a good enthusiasm towards a situation, it'll just feed everybody off of it and everybody will just get on the same vibe and get after. And it's crazy how it's like, it's so simple, but it's, the effects are so great. Absolutely. It's really funny you said that. So a couple of, several years ago, probably, it's probably been a decade ago, I decided that, you know, because I'm big on teaching my, especially my senior leadership team, how do you I want people to experience you. You need to show up in that way. And if you want someone to experience you as inspiring or a good listener or caring, compassion, right? You have to show up so they do experience that. And when you actually describe it, you are so much more likely to do it. And so I decided that I was working with one of my coaches at the time and she was like, what do you want to be the bringer of? And I was like, well, joy, I want people to have a joyful experience every time they interact with me. And, and so she was like, well, that's great. So then go into every interaction with that intention. And so I made all of my team at the time answer that question. What do you want to be the bringer of? Uh, because then you are much more likely to be intentional about it. So even if I'm having a bad day, and I'm grumpy about something, if I want to be the bringer of joy, I know I have to get my mindset right so that I can actually show up that way so people experience it. So I love that because every strong emotion is contagious, whether it's anger or enthusiasm, it can make people take on those things. So anyway, what would you be the bringer of if, if I was going to ask you that question? Yeah, that's a great question. I think for me, it's similar to joy, but just making people like smile. I think when you get someone yeah. to smile, their whole chemistry changes inside their brain and they're just able to look at the situation from a whole new lens and a lot of be a lot more creative. There's a stoic named William B. Irvine who says creativity kills anger. Whenever you're angry and you allow some creativity to come in there, that anger will just slowly subside and you'll be able to be free. And I think that's like what people want at the end of the day to work in a place where they don't feel like they have just a weight on their shoulders, just bringing them down. Their opinions are heard. 
they're doing something they're interested in. That's like the biggest thing I found. Working with people who want to be doing the work because they'll think about it outside of working hours. Not in like a, I'm forced to think about it, but I want to think about it. And the quality of work that will come from someone who wants to work on something is just instantly higher than someone who's, you're just paying to do something. So I think when building teams, that's something I've been looking for, just like spreading joy to those people and letting their creativity and desire to work on that project just really take center stage. Yeah, I, I like that. That's what my book is about, the ownership mindset. <laughs> it's just that, right? How do you get people to think more about than, than they're just their paycheck? And as leaders, we are so have so much responsibility and, and ability to influence that. But, you know, it's not always easy to do if you're not happy. If people don't want to talk about happiness in the workplace, and I don't feel like I'm responsible for somebody's happiness. People are responsible for their own happiness, but I can certainly add to that experience or not. And when you're happy at work, I mean, I know in my experience, I love my job. I'm happy with what I do and it makes me want to give more. I don't think about my work as work. I think about my work as impact. But people are kind of afraid of that word happy. And what does it even really mean? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So for me, it's all about, I use like a simple model, like the house of happiness, where the two foundations are like mindfulness and sleep. If you're not mindful or aware of what's going on, the rest of the houses is going to collapse. And then sleep is important because if you don't have sleep, the whole thing goes away. Like everybody's got done in like an all-nighter before and that's basically like you're yeah. drunk. <laughs> and this is not very pleasant. And so that's your foundation, mindfulness and sleep. And then you have your pillars, which are exercise and then nutrition. So you have your two foundations, your two pillars, and then on top is the house of happiness, your little roof. And... There's a Vietnamese monk named uh, Thich Nhat Hanh who used to say, happiness is available. Please help yourself to it. So I think happiness is an emotion and emotions are hard to put into words. They're quite an ineffable experience. But when you feel happiness, you know it. And Charles Darwin, who father of evolution, used there in his book, Origins of Species, he wrote, it's the vigorous, the happy, the healthy survive and multiply. So even from like an evolutionary standpoint, like he looked at plants and various types of animals he saw that animals can be happy and it's the ones that are happy that are able to thrive in this world. So um, in my mind, that's where that comes in. But in your book, I'd love to hear about the kind of like your biggest takeaways from writing it and distilling your thoughts on how you can get someone to buy into something and make them want to do the thing that you want to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you can make anybody want to. I think you can inspire them, right? But it has to come from within. I always tell people, your career, your life trajectory, that's your responsibility. It's not anybody else's. If you are waiting to be tapped on the shoulder or you expect a spouse to make you happy or a boss to make you happy or a company to make you happy, you're giving away your own power because no one is going to be able to do those things. So make is a strong word. How I look at it is how do we inspire that? And I think you start first by caring. If there was one place that any company needs to start, it is showing that you care about your employees truly. And that takes time, right? It takes getting to know people. You can't care about somebody if you don't know them. It means that you're willing to say, oh, I'm going to forego a short-term gain because this is the right thing to do to care for my employees. And when you start to build that culture of care and people know like, hey, my company's got my back. My boss has my back. My boss cares about my personal and professional development. You start to want to give a little bit more. If you're just a number and you feel that your company doesn't care about you, why would you give anything more? Because they're not going to give more for you. So I err on the side of caring and generosity. And I was actually just talking to one of my HR business partners here. She's new to the company and I'm trying to help her understand our culture. And I said, I am an anti-policy person. Like you have to have policies to protect you in the places where it matters and the places where the law requires. But I like to give a framework for decision-making instead. So here are the absolute policies that yes, you have to go by these two or three things because this is what the law says. But now let's give you a framework for decision-making so that you can take into consideration each situation. And you can use your own discernment to say, I think this is what's best for this situation or for this person. And I think people really appreciate that. So it might not be a policy like, okay, here it's written down. If X, Y, Z happens, this is what you get. No, it's like, okay, you know, this is the foundation of what we do. Here's where the policy is. But now we have this framework for decision-making that we allow our managers to be able to work with their employees to be able to say, here's what the best situation is. 
I think our employees love that. And I've never once heard anybody say, well, it's not fair. That person got a sabbatical because they were having a mental health crisis, but I don't get one. Well, no, you have a mental health crisis. Come on in and let's talk <laughs> about it. We will figure out how to support you and help you and put together a program that will work for you. Not a, well, no, we haven't been here for eight years, which is the only time we give our sabbaticals. Right or wrong, that's how we run things. But I think it really does create that culture of care where people know that your individual situation is going to be considered and instead not just applying a policy to it that might not make sense or work for you. Yeah, well said. And I think I totally resonate with that. And in organizations, I think in large organizations, just like IBM. Uh, I love it. I think it's home to me uh, in a sense. And I, but it's so big. A lot of people I see in it are afraid to make a decision just because say, I have to get an approval yeah. for this. I have to get an approval for that. And if you just constantly need an approval to do something, just nothing's going to get done. And so you're just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting as opposed to just executing based on what you think is best and being able to give your employees that sort of freedom and kind of responsibility without them feeling like they're going to get backlash if they make a decision, I think is vital for the success of a company, whatever stage you're at. And of course, it's a little harder in like massive companies. Um, but like you look at NVIDIA, it's a massive company and the founder talks about that all the time where he's just like, it's a very flat organization. He gets hundreds of emails every day around how to improve the company. He reads them, doesn't respond to all of them because it's impossible. <laughs> but I think just having that openness of culture and having willingness to have that dialogue, I think is key. And is that the kind of company that you're trying to build? I think so. And it's a lot easier because it's smaller and I'm working with people, with friends, right? Oh. So like the two people yeah. that I got into it with the cards, uh, they're both mechanical engineers. I've known them for a while now and I trust them. It's night and day. I don't have to describe things. It's just, they read my mind. And similarly with some of the people that I've met that, for example, the designer, his name is Owner and he lives in Turkey. And I found found him on Upwork and he's the best. We get along great. We send each other memes and that's how we communicate sometimes. And it just makes life easier to work with someone that you're just like, okay, I can just go hang out with you after just because you're able to share that common goal and that common belief system. And you're not wasting time squabbling about random things that don't need to be squabbled about. But then the key is like, how do you build that culture? And I think it's all about hiring the right people. And then when you hire the right people, being open and honest with them and giving them all the degrees of freedom they need up front. Yeah, absolutely. So what is going to need to come next? You said, okay, I wrote this book. You're on tour. just got laundry. There's a lot of work that has to come with it. But I can tell there, there's something else that you're thinking about. So where do you see all of this going? Yeah, so a lot of different paths at this point. The first path is, again, I'm a nerd. Uh, so I'm finishing up a theory for, it's a topological approach to quantum gravity where it's just a melding quantum mechanics and general relativity together, which is like a big problem in today's physics. So that's basically done like a presentation style. So I just want to finalize that, release that. Don't know what's going to happen with that. But I think for me, something I'm more interested in is building something. Kind of like I said, this company is going to help me get my financial freedom, which is key early on in life. And then from there, I would love to work in the tech space. So there was a movie that came out on Disney Channel back like 10, 15 years ago. It's called Smart House. And it was this hologram that just walked around the house and it was, it was inspired me to build like a house of the future, right? Imagine if you have like sensors everywhere that are able to displace holograms whenever you want or a robot that's able to take care of like doing the dishes, washing your laundry, cooking or helping you cook. I think just having something like that in your house, like an affordable price, like $500. Yeah, it's a lot. But when you're buying a house for like $200,000, you know what? That's not that bad. I think that would be like the life-changing company that's like changing the world a little bit. So I don't know how that's going to happen. In life, it works in very mysterious ways. So we'll see how we get there. But that's kind of where the visualizations that are coming into mind. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So I had to ask just because I'm sure that lots of people who are listening might not understand the problem that you're trying to solve between quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity. So what problem are you solving? Yeah, great question. So that's a, a deep dive, but I'll describe it as best as I can at a high level. So there's four... Yeah, as simply as you can. Yeah, yeah. as simply as I can. There's four main differences between general relativity and quantum mechanics. So general relativity describes how uh, space-time curves in relation to matter. So if you have a taut trampoline and you put a bowling ball on it, the bowling ball will, will dip. And if you put marbles around the bowling ball, they'll gravitate around the trampoline. So the same thing happens in space-time. 
star, and then you put planets, the planets revolve around the star. Quantum mechanics describes more so the things in space-time. So you have molecules such as protons, neutrons that combine to form hydrogen, helium, so on and so forth. And the four main differences are that in general relativity, it's kind of like kinematic equations. If I throw something up in the air, you can predict the path of that object. In quantum mechanics, it's more statistical. If I flip a coin, is it going to be heads or tails? So that's the first main difference. The second is the continuous versus discrete. So continuous is something that just, there's no kind of gap in between everything. Discrete is exactly what it sounds like. There's gaps. So like if I draw a circle with, like take your left hand and draw a circle with it, you're probably going to make it smooth. That's continuous. Discrete would be a bunch of little points and that's how you make your circle. That's the second difference. The third difference is, is in quantum mechanics, you're counting how many things there are. This is a molecule. That's a proton. This is another proton. So you can count. So you're using the natural numbers. Whereas in general relativity, it's just based on the real numbers, which is imagine like your number line. And there are some key differences there, which I won't get into because it's a lot. <laughs> and then the last one, which is really a lot, is just there's a different form of measuring. So general relativity has different sort of quote unquote metrics, which is how you define distance in between two points. For, for instance, Euclidean distance is just x squared plus y squared plus d squared equals c squared. Think of the Pythagorean theorem. Whereas quantum mechanics relies on something called a Hilbert space, which is just a different way to define distances. So the approach kind of takes a step back and looks in like the whole grouping aspects of it and remedies kind of like the latter three. I think the first idea of just predicting where a path goes versus statistics is just a very different thought process. And remedying that thought process is going to be a little trickier, but the theory that's being built out, it more so looks at the mathematical undertakings of the other three differences and remedies those in a way that's kind of digestible. I'm a sucker for pictures. Like the book that I wrote has over 200 pictures and this theory is probably, over. The, there's a quick PowerPoint slide that has like 250 pictures already. So I hope that was an understandable and digestible answer to your question. I totally think it was. I totally think it was. Absolutely brilliant. Well, I can't wait. And is this theory in the book, do you explain this in the book or at least at a high level or is this something that you've been working on outside of the book? Completely different. So uh, like I said, when I first wrote the book, it was yeah. 700 pages. That theory was built in those 700 pages, but not explicitly. And I decided to focus mm -hmm. more so on the idea of space theory first and foremost. And then this, I looked back at it after a month or two ago and I was like, you know what? That's still right. So Let's just finish that off, put a bow on it, and then move on to the next thing. I love it. I love it. And so do you think then you'll work for another company? I mean, you left corporate America, did your own thing. What does that look like? Is that what you think you'll go back to? Or do you think you can't do that? Yeah. So I actually, so I went on the leave for two years and then I came back to IBM working on deals. So I'm doing that now just because I needed money to finance the book tour. I spent all my money on just launching the book and making sure that was a success. And I think in the near future, the cards will be able to pay off. They're doing really well on Amazon right now. So it's a cash flow issue just because like you're buying a lot up front. So you got to like wait for that cash to come in. And so it's just like a, it's a waiting game. <laughs> but so the goal is to just, again, gain that financial independence and then either build my own thing or find a small startup that's passionate. I think that's the main thing I've found. Like, I want to work with people who are passionate about the problem. Because like I said, like they'll spend time thinking outside of it. And it, the book is very an individual task. And I think if I f can find a group of people who are really passionate about something, then we'd really be able to create something that's game changing. And that'll be fun, little fun time. <laughs> Until whatever comes next. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> that bit is permanent, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The world is always changing. So who knows what's going to happen? I love it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Good. All right. Well, as we wrap up, I'll give you my signature question, and then you could tell us a little bit more about where to find the book. So the name of this podcast is Reflect Forward. We've even touched on this a little bit uh, of being in that present moment and the past and the future. Uh, what does Reflect Forward mean to you? Mm, beautiful question. Uh, I think Reflecting Forward is being able to have an understanding of what's happened in the past and where you want to go in the future and executing in the present based on those two things. Executing could be reflecting or executing could be actually doing something. So I think that's what Reflect Forward would mean to me. Love it. Great answer. Thank you. All right. And where can you find the book? How, how do you find your book? 
Yeah, book anywhere you buy books, you can find it. The first chapter is available for free online at theideaspace.io. So if you're interested in just learning more about it, you can check it out there. There's also five free bonus chapters. So www.theideaspace.io, best place to check it out. Great, I'll cl include that in the show notes. And if someone wanted to buy your meditation cards, how would they find you? Yep, so on Amazon, if you look up The Idea Space meditation cards, they should pop up. We were Amazon choice for a couple keywords. You can't miss them, they're giant bubbles. That's our brand, because everybody loves bubbles. So if you see the bubbles, you're in the right spot. <laughs> Awesome. All right. I'll go on and make sure I find a link or you send me a link to the Amazon one. I'll make sure I get the right one in the show notes as well. So perfect. If anybody's looking for meditation cards or want to check it out, then they can easily click on it and get to it. Cool. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, I'll definitely send them to you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was such a fun conversation. And thanks for letting me geek out with you a little bit on quantum mechanics and the <laughs> theory of relativity. <laughs> I haven't yeah. thought about those things in a very long time. <laughs> yeah, this was a blast on my end as well. So thank you for having me on, Carrie. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, hang tight. I'll be right back. All right, everyone, I am back. I hope you enjoyed that very fun and very interesting podcast. It was different than anyone that I've ever done. I certainly have never gotten into talking about quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity on a podcast before, but it was so much fun. Amon is just amazing. I will leave you. And with that, I will leave you to your week. I hope it's a good one. If you like this podcast, please consider subscribing to it, writing a review, sharing it with a friend, reading it on your favorite podcast platform. It always helps with the algorithms. It gets these awesome stories with these amazing people who, who the world should know more about. Out there. So thank you. And we'll see you next week.